Well, um, it's a pleasure to speak with you all here today um, on the traditional territory of the Lekwungen. Uh, I'm Emma Wright, Archives Manager at the Royal BC Museum and Archives, and I join the research team I'm going to speak about today in the fall of 2016. The report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada called on the archival profession to review the national level of compliance with UN DRIP and UN JOP. It called upon the profession to do so in collaboration with Aboriginal peoples. It called upon us to produce a reconciliation framework for Canadian archives. While call number 70 was written in response to the violations committed against Aboriginal peoples at residential schools, in these times of reconciliation, the archival profession is responding not only to the context of a right to know the truth about residential school information, it is also responding to the wider scope of reconciliation with Indigenous peoples in Canada and indigenization of archival practice, records and structures. The Steering Committee on Canada's Archives is formed of representatives from the Association de Archivistes de Quebec, the Association of Canadian Archivists, the Canadian Council of Archives, the, Pro the Council of Provincial and Territorial Archivists, and Library and Archives Canada. In 2016, the SCCA put out a call for representatives from across Canada to form the TRC Task Force. The task force is chaired by Erica Hernandez-Reed at UNBC, and membership currently consists of 25 people. This includes 13 archives professionals from provinces and communities across Canada, including LAC and Raymond Frogner of the National Centre for Truth and Reconciliation. There has also been active recruitment of Indigenous partners to the research group. We have 13 Indigenous representatives from BC, Ontario, Quebec, Newfoundland and Labrador, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Northwest Territories, Yukon and Nunavut. And uh, this week we recruited representatives from Inuit Territories. Um, we're still seeking some for Atlantic Canada. Within this group, there's a representation for, from gallery, museum and library professionals as well. So I have up here the task force's mandate showing for you. Uh, we were tasked with creating a reconciliation framework for Canadian archives. And so the group envisioned this framework as consisting of three central deliverables. Number one, we'll be providing some protocols and principles for archival institutions across Canada to adopt. The group's research will result in the creation of this document for endorsement by SCCA and Canadian archives nationally. Number two is we'll be producing some actionable recommendations. So while protocols and principles are fine, they're the policy in theory, the group recognizes that in order for the reconciliation framework to have an, a real impact, the value of establishing some, some concrete actions that can be taken by Canadian archives to further reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. And the third deliverable will be a final report uh, for the uh, uh, steering committee and Canadians to conclude the project. More information on the project, including the charter and a detailed action plan, can be found online, and I've put the link up there for you if you're interested. Um, as the project progress right now, to give you more information, so we applied for a to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada for funding in October of last year, and we're expecting to hear if the project has been approved um, in April of this year, so next month. We're hoping to hear if we've actually got federal funding. Um, we conducted an online readiness survey of archival professionals and archives institutions across Canada in July of last year. This survey was to identify actions and attitudes towards reconciliation, decolonization and indigenization within the Canadian archival context and to provide res um, respondents with an opportunity to share perspectives. Uh, where they had consented for follow-up, a selection of respondents were contacted for a further, more detailed phone survey, and we'll be reporting out the results from that this year. They'll be posted on the website and uh, also disseminated via listserv. Um, other work that we've been doing is we initiated a literature review, so we have 25 project members reviewing articles uh, since the fall of 2017. And this review spans both national and international archival and multidisciplinary discourse to identify what has been done, what has worked, what has failed, and to identify indigenization strategies which might be successful within the Canadian archival context. There will be some follow-up dialogue with selected authors by phone, and then the results from that lit review will be summarized this summer. 
Next steps for 2018, um, we will be conducting some uh, Canadian Indigenous community outreach, so this will be national, um, and each member of the team will be responsible for contacting a number of First Nations governments, organisations or cultural heritage institutions, and uh, that outreach is expected to take place uh, during the spring and the summer this year. So the, the full work the, with the final uh, three deliverables that I, I mentioned earlier, we are expecting that to conclude at the end of July uh, 2019. So the work of the task force and how archives across Canada have been responding to the TRC's final report actually hit the national headlines last month. Um, I have up there uh, the headline from a CTV News article from February 2018, um, Archivists Look to Decolonize Canada's Memory Banks. Um, so I wanted to leave you today with some very real examples of how this project connects with and is impacting and informing the current work and projects here at the Royal BC Museum and Archives. How are we heeding the calls to action? So the Royal BC Museum put out an official response to the TRC report in 2016. Since then, the BC Archives has been undertaking digital repatriation of records to communities. For example, um, the Vancouver Island Treaties have been um, digitally returned to the Signatory Nations. And we've also been responding to requests. Um, so, for example, uh, Genevieve recently catalogued um, and we've had digitized uh, a file on the Kootenai uprising that we are presenting to Tunaka Nation. Since the fall of 2016, where a researcher self-identifies as First Nations Inuit or Métis, or is conducting research on behalf of a First Nation community organization, um, we've been providing them with free copies of uh, records with indigenous content. Uh, other things that we've been working on, we started a digitization project of a collection of linguistics recordings from our First Nations and Repatriation Department in the summer of 2017. Um, these recordings are being preserved and digitized copies given back to the community. This work supports and is vital for language revitalization. Um, I think uh, the preservation team, they've been working on, I think, 450 to 500 recordings have been completed so far, and I just put up there, it's quite small, but um, <laughs> I wanted to demonstrate that we have been doing a lot, but there's coverage there um, from uh, the Times Connellist in August of last year. In November 2017, the museum formed a First Nation advisory committee who will be providing expert advice to our board and CEO. Uh, other la large projects, I mean, Genevieve's already just spoken about uh, the museum's submission of the Ida Helpburn form for recognition by UNESCO. And as she mentioned, that also received a lot of media attention and there's coverage up there from, from the Metro from January 2018. Um, other things, I want to mention the work of archivist Frederick Verspo, who spent the last year editing and revising subject indexing terms on the archive's online catalog to ensure that records with indigenous content are indexed correctly and are more relevant, which what this means is it means they're more findable and useful by the public and, and communities. So an example of this, I've put up there, there's a photo G986. So, um, with these photos, she's been adding in um, community names were identified and removing irrelevant terms. So that photo was indexed with Indian villages and reservations, and uh, she's changed that to Bella Coola Indians, Potlatch, and Bella Coola BC, which, I mean, you can see that people are more likely to be able to find that and know what community um, is represented there. Um, what else have we been doing? Um, this year in January 2018, uh, we spoke to Indigenous communities and researchers up island about BC Archives services and records. And um, we see that as just the beginning. As Genevieve mentioned, the museum has already been connecting with communities, but I think the BC Archives, we really want to do more of that. So given the focus of my research project, those examples I described were predominantly archives and archival reconciliation actions. However, the, B the Royal BC Museum recognizes the importance of the cause to action and has taken them to be just that, a shift in how we operate, not standalone one-off projects. Our First Nations and Repatriation Department was created in January 2017. I've not mentioned their work here, um, but they contribute to reconciliation every day. 
So reconciliation, it's really triggered an organizational shift. We've formed a team to ensure we are communicating reconciliation initiatives across all departments and areas of the museum, from facilities through to finance, including collections and archives. These will be reported out on the website. So I just really want to make a point. This isn't me alone being a part of this work. It's, it's everyone in this room, all of you who work here, are contributing. Um, so I hope I've given you some insight into the focus of my research and how it is relevant to the ongoing work and maturity of this museum. And I look forward to sharing more with you as this research progresses. Reconciliation begins with us, and change begins right here, right now. Thank you.